Welcome back to the Comic Book ASM Artist. Today we're going to be looking through an art book that I've been meaning to do for a while. And it is all about Jack Kirby. And uh, I would say he is my main inspiration uh, for creating comics. You know, he created pretty much most of the Marvel Universe visually and quite a cool chunk of the DC Universe with uh, Darkseid and everything. And, uh, so we're just going to go through this, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, I'm not f super familiar with everything Kirby did, so there'll be some areas where I'm a little unclear, but it is an impressive book regardless. So first off, the inside, we just see Kirby right here in his studio working at his draft table there. You get a nice iconic Galactus image there. And then here's him here with his art. And here's one of his uh, incredible collages where he would, um, I believe he would just cut out photos and adhere them to his comic boards and uh, design around them. I'm not 100% sure on his process, but... This was definitely unlike anything you would see in your books at the time. And this book starts off, it, it covers his whole career, so you get to see a visual journey. Here's a nice uh, self-portrait that he did, and this one is usually fe featured on the... Um, Jack Kirby Collector Magazine, I believe the first issue had this as the cover on it. And I think that they still publish those. I don't know how frequently they come out or not. But um, there's quite a few of them. I think there's at least 50, if not more. Here's another one he did. And this was when he was working with DC, I believe. Here's some of his uh, more realistic pictures that he did here the shading and everything on them. And then uh, one really unique thing he did towards the end of his career, uh, someone commissioned Jack. Jack is known for having um, a really rough childhood. He was a very street savvy kid. You know, in those times they grew up like the Great Depression era and everything. You know, you'd you'd see kids on the street a lot, just fending for themselves. And uh, Jack was notoriously a, a very tough individual, so he always had a lot of uh, stories throughout his life, even in his adult life, where he would, you know, uh, come toe to toe and tell people who were like trying to provide protection for the community that he would protect his own shop he was working in or whatever and just tell like potential gang people to go take a hike but uh if this here this 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 project street code was commissioned um by an individual who was really impressed by kirby's stories and his work and uh the thing with kirby is his stuff was usually just all superhero related so he didn't get to visually draw out things from his personal life, like, you know, biographical, but this guy commissioned him to um, do one of his stories from his childhood and just to draw it out and uh, have it fully rendered without having inks over the top of it, where it was just 100% Kirby's work. So the project was called Street Code, and this is just a story all about, um, you know, the, the hard times of being on the street as a kid with bullying and gang fights and things like that. And the whole thing is 100% uh, Kirby. There's no assists on inks or any redrawings of any faces by anyone. And, and uh, yeah, he did this towards the end of his career. But uh, he wanted to do more of him, but his, eyes start, his eyesight started to go, which is... Um, a reason why he wasn't able to do more of him. So we see in the early days here that um, Kirby actually did work with tons of other pseudonyms. Here we see Jack Curtis would probably be the most similar. Bob Brown, 
uh, Teddy. Uh, this other stuff over here, we see these newspaper strips he did. They're all under Jack Curtis. There you go, here's a Bob Brown. Ted Gray. And there's another Teddy there. And then we see a Kurt Davis here. So he, he had a bunch of different pseudonyms. Another one, Charles Nicholas. Which I didn't know about, so when I read this book, I thought that was really interesting. And, uh, of course, we won't go into all of the stuff here. Like I said, this is... This is really, like, a full encapsulation of his career here. Both visually and narratively. So I highly recommend you to go check out this book so you can actually delve into it and read the full details here. There's another pseudonym, Lance Kirby. And, uh, yeah, the first bit does cover, like, the early Golden Age type stuff. Of course, the Incredible Captain America number one cover there. And I love how they scanned it in where it looks pretty faithful to the comic pages when they were printed at that time. There's our early Stan Lee up here, I believe. But yeah, they're starting to give Kirby a lot more of the recognition now, but really wish that uh, Jack was as big of a household name as Stan Lee is, because like I said, he was really a very huge part of the equation for the creation of most of the Marvel Universe, so... But everyone just goes to Stan because Stan was all about the brand of Marvel, you know. He was the uh, the chairman, the spokesperson. You know, here's some more realistic images here. But, yeah, Jack was a, a workaholic, a very hardworking man. He worked to, to help his family, provide for his family, so he would he would be tied to his desk like insane amount of hours a day he would get I believe I remember his wife saying he would get around like four hours of sleep uh, per day and you know be tied to his draft table like over 14 hours or something insane like that and he was just everywhere he would work on every book you know he'd be working on I think he'd be working on multiple books in the same month which you know these days one artist will work on a single comic 30 days for a 20 page story so to have him just pounding out multiples was unheard of and then another thing is method what from what i hear is like he would just start from the corner of a page and he would just draw everything out and he wanted you know a lot of artists today they'll have like you know their their preliminary thumbnails and the blue pencils and all that and they'll erase and stuff People said they would go visit Kirby and it would all just, he would just make it all happen on those single artboards. He wouldn't have preliminary sketches. He wouldn't be using blue pencil. He'd just be using his regular pencil, just uh, confident and committed to the lines. And they'd be like, oh, well, you draw a lot. We don't ever see a race. And he'd be like, well, they're not paying me to race. They're paying me to draw. And he would just, you know, he'd be pounding it out. And then another thing, too, is uh, he didn't drive. Uh, his wife drove whenever they did go places. She said that uh, he would be very preoccupied in his head just thinking about stories and creating an imagery. So um, he obsessed over that, you know, creating comics was the man's life. So we see here, this is the Fighting American, I believe. Yes. Sorry to ramble there. I wasn't looking at the pages as I was turning them. So this period here, this is when we start to see Jack work without uh, Joe Simon. And we 
you see some of his bold monster images he was known for. And then I think this is where we start to see the Marvel Age of Things. I always try to find um, stuff signed by Kirby. I still really want to have own his autograph, you know. But uh, most of the stuff that uh, does have his signature on it, if it's his CGC graded or whatever, he usually signed most of his comics on the inside first page. So, like, you'd have to have it opened up to read his signature. I think for him, he didn't want uh, the signature to get smudged on the cover, so that's why he put it on the inside first page. So, so that's the thing. Whenever you see all these CGC, they'll say like "signed by Kirby" inside first page or something like that. But it's like I'm not gonna buy the thing slabbed if I can't see the signature. So, but this was fun for me all these years. I never realized that Kirby had done the cover to Amazing Fantasy 15, Spider-Man's first appearance. I always looked at the face here and thought it was very Kirby-esque, but I know that um, he tried to do the Spider-Man interiors, and Stan said, no, you make him a little too thick. You know, he was, he was definitely known for having his guys be very stocky, very buff, uh, like Captain America and Thor. Like, those were solid guys, you know, but he wanted a... Uh, Spider-Man to be more wiry, you know, since he, they wanted him to resemble a spider. So he said, we don't, unfortunately, we're not going to go that direction for this book. But uh, they, they did use his cover, and I didn't realize it because I knew that um they didn't want him on the book. So I didn't put two and two together that he actually did this cover. Although I saw that face and thought it was very Kirby-like, so I thought that was uh, very interesting. And I think if I remember, too, how that got revealed to me is Gary Shipman had done a recreation of this cover, and he said, after Jack Kirby. And then when he typed that out, then I researched, and I was like, I'll be, because, like I said, I had no clue. This is definitely one I'd love to have, too, the Avengers number four. I'd say Captain America issue number one, or 100, whatever you want to call it, in Avengers number four would probably be out of the um, the Marvel age when it all started. Those books would be the ones I would be most likely to acquire. But, and look at this, this works incredible. As the... Um, the movies continue to be successful and everything, even those ones, the value goes up in them, but I'd say that those two are the ones I'm most like, likely to hopefully one day be able to acquire. And I really liked, um, before Marvel used to put out these big, thick books called Marvel Essentials, and they would be all black and white like this, and it'd be like $15, and it would collect like maybe 30 of the comics. And uh, most of them stopped around volume 3 or 4 or something like that. And Now they're putting them out, but they're putting them out in color. So, you know, they're like $35 a piece, and you don't get, you know, the same magic of seeing... Stuff like this, where the um, the pen and ink work is the highlight of the material. I do like to colorize stuff, but there's definitely something special about seeing the black and white form. But, you know, that's just... I think that comes with when you're actually uh, creating the medium. If you're, a re if you're a regular consumer, though, you're like, Oh, why isn't this colored, you know? But I think once you go into the art appreciation realm is when you start to really crave to see things in like the purest form like this. Speaking of which, here is a poster. Here he drew this. 
but then they reworked the face. And uh, this is really towards like the later part of Kirby's career they started to do this, which is kind of silly because, I mean, he was always known for making his faces kind of like that, but I guess they wanted it to be like an on-model thing where, you know, they had an established look in the book. And I could be mistaken too, but I believe Kirby was the uh, innovator for doing the full page splash like this. I could be wrong, but fun side note, all my kids are trying to make their own comics right now too. And so I was teaching my five-year-old girl about splash pages, so she keeps calling it a splat page. But just thought it was funny. Here we see some more just pencil work here. And then here, once again, we see this is how Kirby drew Superman, but then they had another guy come in here and rework the face to make it look more like, you know, the standard Superman model at the time. And then uh, this portion moves into the uh, collage work that Kirby would do. And this was definitely a very iconic cover here. And this takes place with his, his DC work, New Gods, Mr. Miracle. An early excerpt there, it said Kirby was never really too happy when he worked uh, with DC because that was always their thing. Like, you know, Marvel was the competition back in the day for DC. So they were always like, their main goal was to not make books look like what Marvel was putting out, i.e., you know, 80% of it was Kirby, so they were trying to make their stuff not look like Kirby's work. Fun thing, too, I didn't, I wasn't fully aware of Commandi here, um, but um, for me, I'm going to backtrack a, a little bit. I had, um, and I want to say it was fourth grade, we had an assignment to write to our role models, so I wrote to Jack Kirby uh, for my school assignment, and uh, everyone was getting letters back from people that they had written to, whether it was like Michael Jackson or Michael Jordan. They were all getting these signed letters and stuff. And uh, my teacher is like, oh, yeah, sorry, uh, your guy's dead. And uh, this was maybe a year or so after he had passed and I had no clue like it, there wasn't as much network wise as there is now with the internet and everything like that and I was a little kid at the time so she is like your guy died sorry so anytime I meet a creator who I know is influenced by Kirby whether it was Bruce Tim or whoever I always ask them have did you ever meet Kirby uh, what did he say to you, and what was your favorite work of his? And so when I met uh, Kevin Eastman, he said that Commandi was the huge inspiration for him for Ninja Turtles. And I didn't know much of it, but it was pretty much like DC's take on Planet of the Apes a little bit with, you know, a lot of anthropomorphic characters and things like that. So it's on my radar now. I haven't read much of it, but... I want to check it out because it's something that I inspired Kevin Eastman. And then uh, I asked Bruce Tim, he's like, oh, it was, he didn't say anything really. He like, stop crying, kid, type of thing. Like, just fanboy with him. And then uh, Todd McFarlane said when um, he worked with him before, uh, Kirby had actually um, given him back the page that he had inked for him, and he was like, you did a great job, kid, and um, Todd McFarlane was really worried about inking over Jack Kirby's work, but Jack was uh, just really nice and appreciative of the work that Todd did for him, so he um, gave him some encouragement, and he, you know, supported him and his inks that he did on... Uh, on his book at that time. I'm trying to remember which one it was. If I had it in front of me, I would, you know, obviously know what it was. But it, it was a later uh, piece that he had done. But it's always so weird when you look at um, how many lives Kirby touched, you know. 
because especially someone like Todd McFarlane, his art style seems like such a bold departure from the work of Jack Kirby. You know, his stuff's very violent and things like that. And I don't know if just maybe Kirby could have had it in him to where he could do violent, bloody stuff like that too, but maybe it was just like a code standard sort of thing where he wasn't able to. Because when I think of Spawn, I definitely don't think of Jack Kirby. But if you go back and you look at that first issue, it says dedicated to Jack Kirby. And it's like, wait a minute, like... Jack Kirby's stuff is known for, you know, vintage Americana, um, very apple pie filled. It's very wholesome, you know. So to have that in the Spawn book is just kind of a weird juxtaposition, but it's incredible, you know. Um, and I would say that um, there's probably even more artists influenced by Kirby than we are aware of, especially if you use that as an example, you know. Kirby's work was just so incredible. He did so much, and he made so many um, instinctive choices that are emulated daily in comics. I think this is, uh, he drew Paul McCartney and his wife here. I think that's what that is. Yeah, here's him talking to them right there. I'm a Beatles fan too, so of course anytime I see stuff like that, I, I love it. Here's that Hanukkah card that I saw at the Marvel exhibit a couple weeks ago. And I had these. I don't know where I put them, though. The uh, hero stamps. I got the DC and the Marvel ones, but I have no clue where I put them. I thought there was a part in here I remember. Like, the NFL actually commissioned him to do, um, like, mascot designs for all the NFL teams. And so he drew, like, pictures of all the different football teams in his style. Like, galactic style, not like making them look like the football players. And uh, this story right here is actually known to be uh, one of Stan Lee's favorites that he wrote. So if you're ever curious about uh, some of Stan Lee's favorite uh, comics he ever wrote, this one right here, this man, this monster, was one of them. And that's uh, from Fantastic Four, number 51, I believe it says there. I had an opportunity to buy it recently, and I'm kicking myself for not picking it up. It was a pretty decent price from what I remember, but just didn't have it set aside for that. Yeah, so here's the index here. That's going to bother me about the um, NFL thing. Maybe it was in another book. And then here we have, this is the studio presently. You see the workstation here, his board's all dirty and everything now. But, yeah, that is the room where it all happened. That we see, see, same fireplace, everything here. So, kind of crazy, you know. But, yeah, thank you so much, Jack, for the work you've done. And uh, the inspiration that you've caused for millions of creators. Um, just going to let this linger on this for a little, I guess. And uh, that's going to do it for now. Uh, guys, make sure to check out the uh, 100 subscribers video I have uh, for the contest. We're going to be doing that live drawing uh, for those items. We have a signed Clayton Crane Punisher poster and a copy of my book, The Bull Number One. Uh, we're giving that away to one of you lucky people who comment on that uh, 500 subscribers video. Um, and you have to be a U.S. resident. But I'll be doing that drawing uh, next week. Yeah, so check that video out. I'll have a link to that below. And uh, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. 
Uh, let me know what other type of art books you want to see. I have quite a few of them, but I do love doing these types of videos, so let me know. All right, you all have a good day or night. Thanks. Bye.